Good morning, all, and, and thank you. Anna, Anna, can you just quickly confirm that you can hear me? I can hear you. We all can hear you. Wonderful. Um, just a little update to my affiliations, which you would not know, Anna. As of last week, I am now officially the team lead for vaccine development at WHO. So I've moved from a consultancy position to a full-time WHO employee, and I'm now honorary professor of emerging infectious diseases at the London School. Um, next slide, please. Um, I would like to challenge old thinking. Two plus two is not always four. In an increasingly complex world, sometimes old questions require new answers, new slides. When evaluating vaccines, we as researchers and regulators focus on vaccine characteristics such as vaccine efficacy and safety. However, measures of vaccine efficacy and safety data capture only the minimum in information needed for regulatory approval. And those measures do not capture the full public health value of vaccine. From the perspective of the recipients, the communities, and hence also the policymakers, what they are interested is, in is the full public health value of vaccines. Next slide, please. What influences governments most to adopt new vaccines? It is disease burden. Disease burden has been consistently mentioned by policymakers in countries to be the number one factor in setting priorities for vaccines to be introduced into immunization programs. Next slide. We need to change our framework from a clinical trial perspective focus to also include a public health perspective. The clinical trial perspective asks different questions to the public health perspective. In the trial design, it asks, does the vaccine provide direct protection to the individual? But what we really want to know is, what is the total impact of the vaccine in a population? This includes indirect protection. Trials are typically tightly controlled allocation with strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. But what we really want to know is what is the expected real world impact? The per protocol an analysis asks, did the vaccine work as given in the trial design? Whereas what we want to know is what was the total impact of vaccine in the population? Next slide. For today, we will focus on the design, the measures, and the endpoints. So next slide again. The standard clinical trial design needed for licensure is an individually randomized controlled trial, IRCT. And IRCT are using etiologically confirmed endpoints. IRCT should remain the gold standards. I'm not arguing against this. However, we need to acknowledge the shortcomings of IRCTs. Uh, and these are, um, as you can see here, indirect effects cannot be measured. There's often insufficient power for rare but yet important outcomes such as mortality. There's usually insufficient duration of the clinical trial observation time for some important outcomes, such as asthma, wheezing for RSV, or neurological sequelae for meningococcal disease. And it focuses on etiologically defined disease, which may, and I will show you later, which may greatly underestimate all disease. Um, next slide, please. To measure the indirect effect, a cluster randomization trial design is often more appropriate. Cluster randomization trials are experiments in which clusters of individuals rather than independent individuals are randomly allocated to in intervention and control clusters. Have you seen this figure by Ara Longini before? Um, so the IRCT here, just have a look, is on the left. So the attack rate in a vaccinated compared against the attack rate in the unvaccinated. 
So where here do you measure the indirect effect? It's a difference. If you look at this between the health and outcome in the unvaccinated in the left group versus the unvaccinated in the population control group. Overall effectiveness is then the health outcome in the total group. So that's the vaccinated and unvaccinated versus the unvaccinated group. So a cluster randomized control design allows for estimation of population level vaccine impact, including indirect, total and overall effects. And I really hope you look at this slide once again later on. But we also have to acknowledge that the downside of, an, of a CRCT is more complex than an IRCT because it often requires larger sample sizes and therefore it adds costs and complexity. Regulatory agencies are not used to interpreting CRCTs. So while an IRCT will remain the gold start, I'm not arguing against it. The CRCT should be seriously considered for vaccines where we expect a high indirect impact in order not to underestimate the performance of such a vaccine. And one, one, one example is, is, for example, pneumococcal vaccines. Regulatory agencies should also allow CRCTs in the licensure pathway. Next slide, please. As said, efficacy is the traditional assessment. VE is a characteristic of the vaccine and thus an important measure for licensure. Yet, focusing on VE alone may lead to a translational gap, may lead to a gap between licensure and being in, indeed being introduced. Why? Next slide, please. Because of a focus on efficacy, alone. Let me just, um, so, so the numbers here are all real numbers, not invented. They are examples from efficacy trial, from efficacy results from published trials. And so you see half of which had a VE of 50% or less. If a 50% threshold were to be chosen as a threshold for introduction, then all those in red or pink would not be acceptable and would hence not be introduced into countries. Yet, vaccines, even with a low efficacy, may have a public health impact. So what measures can be used instead of efficacy? Let's move to the next slide. Quick reminder, efficacy is a proportionate reduction compared to the unvaccinated group. It's often calculated as one minus the hazard ratio. It is a proportion or a percentage or a fraction. Now, let me ask you, would you prefer 100% of my salary or 20% of Bill Gates' salary? The answer is easy. What counts is not the proportion, but the absolute number. Therefore, we need to look at vaccine preventable disease incidents and number needed to vaccinate. And now most of my lecture will be focused around this. So please pay attention and you may have, may need to have your calculator prepared because I'm going to let you um, calculate something. So VPDI, vaccine preventable disease incidents, has several synonyms, including vaccine attributable risk or vaccine attributable rate reduction. It is the incidence of a given disease preventable by a vaccine in any given context and is defined as outcome incidence in an unvaccinated population times vaccine efficacy. It thus incorporates both vaccine efficacy and the underlying burden of the disease. This is mathematically equivalent to the incidence in the control group minus the incidence in the intervention group. It is reported as cases per 100,000 vaccinated persons per year for the duration of the trial or the observation period. 
Let's move to NNV, number needed to vaccinate. Some call it number needed to treat NNT, but it's NNV for the vaccine here in the vaccine context. It's often used as a metric of the economic value of vaccination programs and can also be used as a proxy for, or for, for cost effectiveness studies. NNV is a measure to quantify the number of people that need to be vaccinated or the number of vaccine doses that need to be used to prevent one occurrence of any target health outcome. So to prevent one occurrence of any target health outcome. So while VPDI is reported as cases per 100,000, NNV is calculated as 100,000 divided by VPDI, divided by the length of the study or immune uh, or, or trial duration. Or you important, the higher the VPDI, the lower the NNV. You need to understand this because you are going to calculate some web VPDI and NNV now. So let's repeat before you I'll make you measure. Efficacy is a fraction. VPDI is an incidence difference. VPDI takes into account the background incidence and so, so the burden of the disease and the efficacy. NNV is the inverse relationship of VPDI. So um, let's move to the next slide. So uh, I'm giving you two very, very simple, simplified examples, both by and large reflect the reality. So the first one is a little bit exaggerated, but I think it, it makes, makes the case. To make the calculation easier, let's say meningococcal vaccine has an efficacy of 100% and meningococcal disease has an incidence of 1 per 100,000. What is the VPDI? I'm giving you a second, and Anna, there's an answer, just tell me because I may not hear. Shout it out if you have an answer. They haven't had enough coffee, Annalise. I think you <laughs> need to give the answer. Oh, they, I'm not like One, zero, zero. I heard one, zero, zero. Very good. One. one, one. The VPDI is one only. Now let's move to dengue vaccine. Dengue vaccine has a known efficacy of around 60%. The attack rate of symptomatic dengue is about 4%, so 4,000 per 100,000, because we're using 100,000 as a denom uh, denominator here. So what is the VPDI for dengue? 4,000 divided by 100,000 times 0 0.6. What is it? 2.4, I heard. Not yet, not there, no. You have missed a few zeros. 2,400? Perfect. 2,400. So it's one against 2,400 despite, despite the VE being 100% for mental cognitive disease. It's an extreme example just to make the case. So now let's move on to the next slide. What is the NNV? Remember, it is 100,000 divided by the VPDI. So you know the VPDI for mental cognitive disease. So what is, what is the number needed to vaccinate for mental cognitive disease? using meningococcal vaccine with 100% efficacy. 100,000. Excellent. You have to 100,000, you got it. So uh, what about dengue? Forty one, I heard. Forty one thousand? No. So 4,160. <laughs> no, it's 100,000 divided by 2,400. We don't have calculators. Ah, I'll tell you. 41.6. All right. So you only have to vaccinate a small number to, to avert a symptomatic dengue case versus 100,000 for meningococcal disease. As an extreme example. Let's move to the next slide, please. I want to express the same message in a different way with absolute risk reduction versus efficacy. Next slide, please. So here, um, so just to remind you, another term or word for efficacy is relative risk reduction. Here you see the different scenarios with different attack rates ranging from 60% to 3%. The relative risk here is 0 0.6 for the vaccinated versus an, an unvaccinated. And remember, efficacy is calculated as one minus hazard ratio or one minus RR. So the efficacy here is 0 
So 33%, right? You got, you, you're with me. The efficacy remains the same. As you see here, go through all this. That's the interesting part. The learning part is remains the same regardless of the attack rates. The absolute risk reduction is, however, highest in the high attack rate scenario. And here, the NNV is lowest. The NNV is very high in the scenario of low disease attack rate, despite the exact same RRR, relative risk reduction or efficacy. You've got this. So next slide, please. So now lo let's look again at the previous vaccines that were deemed to fail because of poor vaccine efficacy below 50%. Now look at this. Suddenly, uh, now we can't claim VPDI. Suddenly, rotavirus vaccination in Malawi fares better than rotavirus vaccination in South Africa. Pneumococcal and HIV vaccines, which are green, hence had an efficacy that was initially above 50%, now look worse than that of rotavirus vaccination in Malawi. How do you explain this? So again, VPDI assesses the amount of disease times the VE, VE. So it means that the burden of rotavirus in Malawi is higher than the burden of pneumococcal disease. Let me illustrate this better, and let's go to the next slide, uh, by zooming into the story of rotavirus vaccines. And many trials were done around the world for rotavirus vaccine efficacy. Rotavirus vaccine efficacy uh, against rotavirus GE is, is, is higher in high and middle income countries compared to low to middle income countries. And I can't go into why, why this is, but many potential factors such as malnutrition, presence of other gut pathogens, concurrent diarrhea could explain the observation that efficacy in clinical trials is lower in lower income countries. So based on this, should we now not use rotavirus vaccine in lower income countries then? Uh, next slide. In this world map, one dot stands for 100 deaths. This map shows that most of the deaths occur in low income countries. Clearly, mortality is highest in low to middle income countries. Next slide, please. In which country are more rotavirus cases prevented by rotavirus vaccine? I think, I think you have to click one more time. In South Africa, the phase three efficacy result was higher with 77% uh, compared to 50% in Malawi. Yet more cases are prevented in Malawi than in South Africa, 6.8 versus 5.4. Um, even with lower vaccine effectiveness or effect, uh, the higher disease burden in lower income countries will translate into a higher VPTI and hence will have a greater public health impact in low income countries than in high income settings. So if policymakers had based the decision on efficacy alone from the clinical trials, maybe this vaccine would not have been adopted. But now looking at VBTI, which is a much more appropriate market for the real world impact of new vaccination program, clearly this vaccine should have, should be introduced. Next slide, please. Here are the VPDI figures from the previous slide, and here translated into NNV for South Africa and, and Malawi. In comparison, below also the VPDI and NNV for two Asian countries. In Bangladesh, the phase three trial results were particularly low for the efficacy. But despite this, the VPDI is higher, so better, and the NNV is lower, so better, and so we're more favorable compared to the other three country examples. Next slide, please. We're now moving to another uh, to uh, to the the back to the framework of clinical trial perspective, and then, now let's zoom into the clinical endpoints. Next slide, please. So, as we said, IRCTs, individual randomized control trials, focus on etiologic. Annalise, I think we're, your slides are a little behind. Yeah, it's just, uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we're now moving to the clinical endpoints. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, so the, um, the, the problem with, I, with, with etiologically confirmed disease outcomes are uh, that most assays are not sensitive enough and will not diagnose all pathogens, so will underestimate. Case definitions may be imperfect 
or there could be just very practical reasons during a trial, such as a weekend or something else, where, where the diagnostic essays were missing or were not done. But the, and so therefore it will be underestimated in, in any clinical trial if you focus on intellectually confirmed disease. And, but also for policymakers, in the end, it, he is not interested in etiologically confirmed disease outcomes. They are interested in clinically relevant outcomes. So next slide, please. So now let's apply VPDI for etiologically confirmed disease versus clinically relevant disease or syndromic uh, approach. Here are three examples from the literature. In the Gambia, using PCV9, so it's all the study, VE against etiologically confirmed radiological pneumonia was 70%. And the VE against clinical outcome uh, was only 37%. So it here looks worse. But now look at the VPDI. The VPDI was 10 times higher. What does that mean? It means the burden of pneumonia is far higher, far, far higher than the burden of etiologically confirmed pneumonia. In Indonesia, a similar finding was seen for hospitalized meningitis. At the bottom, data from Kenya on rotavirus vaccines use shows that the VPDI for acute GE was about six times higher when measuring vaccine impact on clinical disease in a community than against confirmed disease in hospitals. And now let's tr translate all this into NNV and remember the lower the NNV, the better. Um, next slide, please. So I would now like to move into and uh, just click again. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and now I want to move to, to COVID-19 vaccines. So I, I really spent the last three years on nothing else um, but um, um, COVID-19 vaccine uh, policy formulation for, for WHO. Really fascinating time in itself <laughs> would, would uh, require a full, full talk. Um, um, so, where am I? Um, so I just want to share that um, vaccine efficacy is by and large pretty similar across all age groups. However, the rates, so the incidence rates of the disease are not. Um, so in unvaccinated children, um, we see, for example, only uh, four hospitalizations in a population of one million in contrast 400 hospitalizations in those 70 years old. So, so now also we try to look at SAGE at NNV. Next slide, please. Remember that NNV are context specific. And so here I'm only showing you data from the UK. You only need to vaccinate 300 elderly persons with a primary series to avert one case of hospitalization versus having to vaccinate 30,000 children to, to avert one hospitalized um, case in children. Now, looking at these NNV helped us at SAGE to categorize into priority use groups for optimizing the public health impact of the use of COVID-19 vaccines. High priority uh, use groups are older people, we all know. Medium priority use groups are non-elderly adults and the really low priority use groups are children and adolescents, just even if you look at this at this slide. Remember, NNV has to be lower to have a better impact. So you will appreciate it. Vaccinating healthy children and adolescents has a lower public health impact. I'm not saying it has no benefit, but it has a lower public health impact. Next slide, please. And here you see the same. Uh, now, start, um, now categorize by whether you are a healthy person versus you have versus having comorbidities. And you see here, NNV is much higher in those who have no comorbidities versus those with comorbidities. And that is why, again, Sage decided to classify adults with comorbidities into the high priority use groups, even if they are younger. Whilst then the younger non-elderly without comorbidities are the medium use groups group. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here we look at NNV stratified by primary series, first booster and additional booster. You will see that the greatest impact is with the primary series. And that must be said all over again. It's, 
Um, and and one could argue maybe also with the first booster. So the primary series and first booster almost as a package. Um, however, one has to vaccinate a much larger number of persons to avert one case of hospitalized cases for of hospitalized COVID for the second booster. So the second booster is less cost effective. You need a higher number of uh, uh, numbers to vaccinate for the same public health impact. The largest impact is with the first with the primary series and first booster. This, this figure has though another lesson. You look at this, at this, a second booster in elderly still has a lower number needed to vaccinate, hence a higher public health impact than even a primary series in younger adults. And these data on NNV led us to revise the WHO roadmap on prioritizing COVID-19 vaccines. I can't show you the prioritization roadmap, but it was published. Um, so next slide, please. I really want to come and wrap up, wrap up. So I don't think I need to repeat this again, but there are major, there are, these are the differences between VE and VPDI. Well, the vaccine efficacy is a, is a measure for licensure. VPDI is a measure for public health value, a proxy for cost effectiveness, assesses the amount of disease prevented, uh, varies by setting, so it's less stable than a VE. Um, is higher uh, for for a country with a high burden of a certain disease and a high VPDI results in a low NNV and and NNV and VPDI help in prioritization and actually helped us also at WHO with the with with the prioritization roadmap for COVID nineteen vaccines. Next slide, please. Ooh, oh, click again. So to wrap it all up and summarize it. Uh, traditionally, we have always focused on efficacy and safety, mobility and mortality at individual level, on etiologically confirmed, laboratory confirmed pathogens and cost benefit analysis. But we really, what is important, click please again. Uh, yeah. Uh, what we really need to know is the public health value, and that is based on a disease reduction directly and indirectly and has several outcomes that is more than what you measure in usually in an IRCT. That includes long-term sequelae, other health measures like antimicrobial resistance, overall all-cause mortality, under-5 mortality, and VPTI and NNV. But also importantly, it really also focuses on, on non-health benefits. And we need to broaden from a narrow health outcome to also include non-health outcomes. While I focus today or this morning on measures of health outcomes with a strong focus on disease burden alone beyond you know, the traditional efficacy measure, in the next talk by Mark Miller, I think you will, you will, he will focus more on the non-health outcomes such as economic and societal benefits of vaccination. And here with the next slide, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Annalise. And I think we're ready for questions. Questions? All right, let's start here and then there. Start first, right here. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Um, Name? Up oh, there it goes. Looks like it's working now. The red light's on. Oh, it's not working. Mike's not working. The mics aren't working. Thank you. This is Anna from the Netherlands. So I think a very common question that everybody has here. So you focused a lot on the number needed to vaccinate for the disease burden. But uh, how do you take into account the societal burden, psychological burden, economic burden? Is there a sort of, because I think all countries struggled a lot with that, is there a sort of an algorithm to take into account all these these burdens? <laughs> so you're asking the question that it's for the, ne for the next next speaker. I in this I was asked to only focus on, on disease burden and these and and to try to move away from the traditional. Obviously. Um, uh, uh, Mark Miller will probably sh share you how, how other the non, so non health outcomes, which are equally important. In fact, probably more important, but not part of my, my talk to really 
um, articulate the public health value of any vaccine. And just to let you, all of you know, uh, so at WHO, there's now a whole working group really working on the full continuum of public health value assessment and to really help the world articulate the public health value so that it is it does go beyond um, just the burden of that specific health outcome, but takes into account um, other, other societal impacts, including, including uh, for example, in the COVID um, aspect, you know, the, the economic um, on, on the lockdowns, the mental health of, of, of issues, but it's another measurement. Thank you for your question. I'll go to Rita. Yeah. Thank you so much, Annalise. <clears throat> so I'm trying to understand kind of the norms that the countries uh, use and, and fully appreciating that like different countries will be using different norms. So in terms of like you showed the NNV for pediatrics for COVID, how does that compare to kind of the NNV for influenza vaccination in pediatrics? So very, very important. And, uh, so, we, and there is a slide, which I didn't include here, which we, um, discussed and looked at, at Sage. And I can only describe it to you because I can't pull it up so quickly. Um, so it's very important. So, so for the, for the, for the pediatric indication for COVID-19 vaccines, it's clear cut. The NLV is much less uh, favorable compared to older adults, but it would be unfair to the children to only compare to older adults. So you also have to look and compare, as you said, with, within, within the children's uh, diseases. So we, so we did look at this and we looked again at, um, and, and we pulled uh, various literature and it's clear cut, very clear, not only, <laughs> um, the, the vaccine preventable disease incidence, uh, and the NNV to avert deaths, uh, for COVID is much less favorable at this stage not earlier on in the pandemic, at this stage of the pandemic compared to most, most all other uh, vaccine preventable diseases in childhood. And the, the, bad, the bad news the world was, as if, if you know, there was a backsliding because of COVID and there's a major coverage loss uh, for, for many of the, of the routine childhood vaccinations because of COVID. And our message from the WHO to the world is focus on getting your children vaccinated with the routine child vaccinations before you think of giving COVID-19 vaccines. We are not saying COVID-19 vaccines are not beneficial. They are, of course, beneficial, but they have, uh, in, in terms of cost effectiveness, and now we are at a time of, um, of the pandemic where we do have to think about um, opportunity costs, you know, the, the costs on, on, on other programs, on other vaccine, uh, childhood coverage, etc. cetera, that we have to take this into account. And, and in that whole context, so not just the disease specific or, or deaths, um, the um, vaccinating children with COVID in a global context in LMICs should be less um, important compared to really focusing on re-vaccinating and making sure that all your children have your routine childhood vaccinations. So, so the NNV uh, is clearly not as favorable. You have to vaccinate many more children uh, at this time of the pandemic when we have high population level immunity and where, where MISC, et cetera, is, is less commonly seen comp in, in, the, in the Omicron era compared to early on. Did I, did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Yep, this works. Hi, this is Wicked. Um, thank you for this really um, thought-provoking um, talk. So I have a question. How can we implement this concept early on into vaccine design and development also in combination with a regulatory framework? Because obviously this is not currently the paradigm under which we develop vaccines. So you can actually use the data because from the, from the phase three trials, because they do have the incidence in the control and the vaccinated group. So you can actually, you can actually with the trial data calculate your VPTI. So, so it is, and so, and the policymakers, you know, you first have regulatory approval. Then the next step is the NITAX or, you know, or, or strange regulatory authorities like EMAM and then, uh, sorry, <laughs> then NITAX and then, and then, and then SAGE. Uh, they they really need to sit down and and use the available data to calculate VPTI, and it's you know for some vaccines there is a there is a clear cut case for introduction, 
for other vaccines where the VE is partial, moderate, um, you know, you really have to use additional measures such as VPDI and others. And I'm only here focusing on VPDI. You know, Mark Miller will show you several others that we need to take into account. And they really need to sit down and do so at policymaking levels. But unfortunately, as you said, some questions can, and, and, and the main question is the indirect impact. The indirect impact, if you have done an individualized randomized control trial, can only be measured really in post-introduction studies. And so post-introduction studies should be, should be conducted Often even the, the companies, the industry will want to conduct it for a vaccine where they felt the efficacy was moderate to prove to the, to show to the world, um, that how, how impactful it was. And in fact, it's a good investment for companies. In other cases, it's some, sometimes academic groups that have to, to pick up the case. I, but I can tell you, for example, for the use of pneumococcal vaccine, the, in, the, the, you know, the indirect impact was so high that it really strengthened the case for the use if you had done a post um, so phase, phase four studies to do so. And I think I think my 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 talk is a um um maybe um, maybe a signal um that we should at least consider the more complex randomized control trials already at you know for pre-licensure for vaccines where we anticipate a high indirect um, uh, impact. Matthew and then Maru. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. I, th I think most of the question I was going to ask you just to answer, but let me just try to frame it in a different way then. So for sort of for NITAGs, both low and middle income countries and high income countries, why is this not incorporated sort of earlier? Is it, is it more of a lack of available data on disease burden? Because I, I think disease burden is in the mind of the NITAGs when these decisions are being made. But what I'm hearing is that we need a, a complete sort of reframing of the conversation. So why are we where we're at right now in terms of this particular question? Over. So I believe we are already much further ahead than, 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 than before COVID. Um, and, and this and this lecture is meant for all of you, you know, to make sure that your NITACs include these kind of uh, measures. What what I said was really nothing revolutionary. All these data have been available, you know, published. Uh, this approach has been published. But I think I think when COVID came, <laughs> and at WHO level, we, you know, we were often asked, well, is the mRNA better? Than the uh, than the viral vector, and if you look looked at point estimates of vaccine efficacy, in fact, you could argue. But actually, we also at a WHO level, we we then recalculated as VPDI, and I didn't show you that slide either. But the VPDI of the AstraZeneca clinical trial at that time was almost the same as the VPDI for 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 the mRNA vaccines, and and we at WHO intentionally therefore decided not to use any preferential language uh, and to and to recommend all these vaccines get them out early as quickly because the public health impact is highest the more uh, vaccines are in the arms of, of people rather than waiting for the so-called better vaccine same for the booster anyway to, to answer your question um, we we all need to rethink we need to re we need to educate our night tax to involve these kinds of measures and, and thinking. Maru? Um, thanks, Annalise, for that great talk. This is Maru Shield from University of Sydney. I had a question about the number needed to vaccinate and the use of those um, even in designing vaccine stra strategies, particularly thinking about outbreak response. So how does, I guess, the vaccine effectiveness and the R effective come into play and does number needed to vaccinate have a usefulness in that context as well? So I think you should use number needed to vaccinate uh, to prioritize. So in an outbreak situation where you where you have limited supplies, like we had for COVID, you have to think, how do I achieve the maximum public health impact with limited vaccine supply? That's what we did. And for that, as you all know, this is how the, the WHO roadmap for prioritization was started. And, and, and it was clear cut 
Your biggest public health impact is when you use a limited amount, fully only for older people and those at, with, with severe comorbidities. And that would have not only a minor increase in public health, it, it, a manifold increase in, in public health impact. So, so using NNV, I think, is a very, it's very simple. It's almost, you know, you, cal you calculate it on the, on the, on the tissue paper. It's so, it's so simple and should be used in any outbreak situation or in any situation where you don't have enough vaccine supply so that you maximize and prioritize by prioritization. And I think our last question will be from. Yeah, it will be from John, uh, Sue. Uh, number needed to vaccinate to reduce disease will not be static over the course of the pandemic or an outbreak. Hopefully, disease burden will decrease with time, increasing the number, of, the number to treat. How do we account for this changing value? No, that's, that's a very important take-home message. So both VPDI and NNV, because they're correlated, are totally dependent on the burden of disease. So it will vary by by context and over time. So it's different within, within countries, different age groups, and will vary over time, whilst VE is much more stable or static. Um, so, so it needs to be taken into account. And, and for, for modeling purposes, therefore, we also need dynamic modeling. Dynamic modeling, in contrast to static modeling, uh, takes into account all these variations over, over time. And vaccine effectiveness will reduce over time. You know, a second booster at this stage of the pandemic for COVID, for example, has much less of an impact than it had uh, a year ago even. So, 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 yes, you need to be fully aware that this is context and time specific. It's very.